Hello, my name is Sarah James and welcome to the Digital Craft Festival. Today I'm talking to a group of exhibitors about the fascinating subject of skills and processes. And today I'm joined by textile artist Claire Walsh, jeweller Holly Susanna Tifford, potter Daniel Williams, textile artist Linda Shell, jeweller Olive Rose and textile artist Liz Pussy. Thanks for coming today, everyone. Hi. I'm, going to, Hi. Hello. I'm going to talk today. I'm going to go in order. So I'll tell you, I'm going to go straight to Olive Rose. Obviously, Olive Rose, obviously, I know you as Emma. Yeah. Yeah. And you're based, where are you based, Emma? I'm in Taunton in Somerset. And how long have you been making? Um, so I graduated in 2008 from Middlesex University. And my, uh, so since then, really, yeah. And what did you do there? Um, so the course itself was just called textile, um, sorry, we're just called jewellery, but I focus very much on textiles because I love that kind of repetitive process of kind of um, knitting. I never could crochet, uh, found tatting when I was in my final year and just haven't really stopped doing it. Well, that's what I wanted to talk to you about, really, because um, I remember uh, uh, a quite a well-known figure in the craft world was asked what was tatting on the radio once, and I was like, Mimi, I know what tatting is, but only because I used to work at a textile museum in Halifax, uh, and I, ha I certainly hadn't heard about it before then. So, do you want to? Can you explain a little bit more about what you make and and, the, and those specific processes that you do? Yeah. So, um, I mean, it st it stems from really long back, and it sort of actually comes from knotting. I was trying to do a bit more research on it, and I clouded my my you know knowledge of it but basically what I know it from is um Victorian uh, lace craft where the women used to have a little pouch and they had a little shuttle that would have looked something a bit like this but it would have been made from bone or silver and it's a process where you wrap the thread around your hand and then you form knots under and over this kind of line um, and when you pull them through it's a series of slip knots you get a little loop basically and um Traditionally, they use little picots, so little loops to attach them together. And it gets very ornate and very fussy. And I really wanted to strip it back to bright colours, uh, basic loops, and then teaming it with silver. So is it is it a micro crochet, you know, in, in lots of ways? Um, a lot of people think it is because the shuttle itself has this little hook on it. But this yeah. hook you don't actually use when you are doing the tatting. That is just when you are linking two together. So you're actually just using this shuttle and the thread passes between your finger and thumb and the shuttle. So it's basically like forming a series of slip knots, basically. Yeah. And so it, it could be more similar to maybe macrame or that kind of that French um, knotting that you used to do for like friendship bracelets, like that little under and over knot. So what how do you combine that then into your work? So for a lot of years, I just did the textiles element and I used to just get chain, add it to chain before I kind of built up my silversmithing skills. In 2018, um, a friend. Claire Lowe actually let me loose at her, her bench and I started to solder and I had all these ideas. So I just take silver wire and I manipulate the wire to kind of replicate those shapes and hammer and texturize. So again, everything sort of comes from a line, a line of silver or a line of thread. Well, it's, it's a beautiful, they're beautiful, it's so delicate. Are they? They're a beautifully delicate piece. I love the way they're combining the, that, you know, textile technique with the jewellery and the way that the work is developed you're quite pleased so going into actual silver and jewellery has that has that broadened things out for you yeah I love it now and I'm so lucky the studio I'm in now my husband built during lockdown number one and I've just started stone setting and I've, I'm just starting all new collections and that freedom to play with the silver to kind of and then combine it with the lace and I just love that it's you know I don't always look up traditional techniques my new stone setting I've pretty much just done it the way I want I try and do it the way people do it and I seem to mess it up so I think art is very much about trying to achieve something you want to achieve but do it in your own way because that's the only way to get that uniqueness I think yeah well I think the, the, the work speaks for itself so I'm going to talk to Daniel now for a few minutes if that's thanks Emma hi Daniel so where you where are you at the minute where's where's your workshop uh, I've got a workshop down here in Sorby Bridge which is West Yorkshire actually just outside of Halifax oh there we are because I used to I used to work at Bankfield oh yes 
That's yes, I was I was actually officially the Calderdale Council's crafts officer. Ah, okay. very fancy. Yeah. It was my first proper job. <laughs> but um, I love your work and the Euro Potter. And um, why do, well, you tell us a little bit more about what you do. So um, I throw pots on the wheel mainly, but uh, I don't throw in the conventional way. I modify my clay before I work with it. So I'll mix in stones mainly into the clay and then try and throw with it, which means you have less control and the stones dictate a bit more as to what happens during the throwing and also during the firing. So you get some very, very crazy results sometimes. It's a bit of a, a dangerous way of working, but it's, it's exciting and quite a fun way of working. So, so yeah, that's kind of what I do. Because it's almost like, because I've got a piece of your work and there are great big stones that have jutted out of it. And it seems to me that you're trying to make the world work explode, but also stay together at the same time. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a fine balance of trying to work with material to it, it, it's just it's treading quite a fine line just to stop it completely collapsing or falling in on itself or exploding, but just enough so if it can hold itself together and when it comes out the firing, you get some very interesting pieces which are just, they look like they're not going to survive and then they're quite uh, you've got cracks in them which in the, in the pottery world is a big no-no. You don't want cracks or holes or anything, but that's kind of the way I work. And just to give you an idea, a close-up, that's a small piece and it's got a hole in it. And then on the inside, you get all the stones melting through and running through the glaze. And I find it fascinating. I, um, I feel like I'm more of a, a facilitator of the work to get it's got its own mind as to what it wants to do and and unfortunately as well they don't always survive i do unfortunately lose quite a few pieces yeah because do you, how are you firing are you with wood yeah i should have said that uh yeah so it's uh, wood fired uh in a uh, kiln which i built back when i used to live in wales the kiln's still there um and the wood firing just adds that little bit of an extra element to it because as opposed to say an electric firing where you're just heating up the the atmosphere and then the glazes melt within the wood yeah, yeah. Flow, you have the ash flying around within the kiln atmosphere altering the glazes and 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 marking the work and leaving its own sort of story yeah. so on you take it from oh uh, holly'd like to ask a question <laughs> well yeah can i just ask when you're actually throwing it on the wheel um i'm imagining these stones are quite sharp like do you not damage your hands yeah, when you're um, shaping I, it and stuff I do try and choose stones that aren't quite so, yeah, that I, I do value my hands because without yeah. them, so. so I tend to choose stones that have uh, from rivers generally because they're nice and smooth and pebbly. Ah, uh, okay, so they're not naturally occurring in the, say in that the again. clay. They're not naturally occurring in the clay, you like, you choose a stone no, to no, go no. in. Ah, okay. Yeah, it's... It, it does stem. There is there is a reasoning. But there's a lot of reasons why I do it. But um, over yeah. in the Far East, I, um, I remember seeing some work when I was studying in Manchester University, and the the work there had these little stones melted out of them. And because they dug the clay up and they didn't sort of uh, homogenize it or make it pure, they, these little stones would just be in there naturally. Not many, just a few odd. And I thought that was really interesting. And I think that mm. was seed of where it started and then I've just progressed to throwing ridiculous amounts of stones in the clay. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. <laughs> does, it, does, it go, does it go in dry? Because I know there's some wood-fired potters of, uh, there's, but there's a few up on Dartmoor that are actually putting it in uh, wet so to, to actually create more problems you know so have you do you put it in dry? No, I haven't tried that um, I, I don't have I haven't had any experience of trying with the clay that's still wet firing it but I, I think uh, you might be referencing a chap called Nick Collin he did I, I am I am I mean his stuff does literally explode yeah uh, or, 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 but I think that's what he's trying to do to a certain extent you know a bit like you it's almost like you're creating a situation where, as you say, you, you're, try, you're putting it into another realm, really, aren't you, of what, what, what comes out? Yeah, yeah, you, you're kind of putting elements in there to, to produce random results with the hope that it all, all the elements work together and you create something that you're happy with and, yeah. 
So without without sounding like you know they all they all blow up because obviously they don't. But what kind of percentage failure rate do you have? Um, it depends. Some firings have lost up to fifty percent. Other firings have only lost about say five ten percent at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I guess it takes other stuff out with it, doesn't it? Yeah, the, the the worst ones to to fire are the tall ones. I've had they're like skittles. So once one goes, they all go. So it was a, quite a mess. But I, I'm, like I was saying earlier on, it's it's about trying to do things on the edge. Yeah. Most the interesting things happen. So you have, and is that something that you've always been interested in as a maker? Um, when I first started out, when I, I studied at Manchester Metropolitan University and I did 3D design uh, with a view of going into design uh, as a three-dimensional designer, not as a potter at all. And so when I discovered ceramics there on the, on the three-dimensional design course, I went into doing uh, mass, not mass produced, but um, batch production where um, still wood fired, but without the stones, just using natural materials to make the glazes as such. And it's just yeah. progressed over the years. I found I'm not I'm not a fast thrower, so I'm not suited to batch reduction. I'd rather leave that to the professionals who can throw a lot quickly. I, I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. This is, it's 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 a it's a different thing, isn't it? But it's also, this, helpful, yeah. you're, you're you're thinking again as well a lot about each piece, and that doesn't ha doesn't really work in production throwing, does no, it? No. In, in, in the nicest possible way, production throwers. But you know, it's kind of a different thing, isn't it? Oh yeah, 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 definitely. Um, each piece, yeah, I will think a lot about each piece as it progresses and, and each thing I have to do to them to get them to the final stage. It take, yeah, it's a slow process. I only fire the kiln maybe twice a year. Yes, quite, yeah. really. So you take, so twice a year you could lose half of everything you made? Could do, that. that's the worst case I've had. That was quite a few years back. It was quite depressing yeah. when you yeah. opened the kiln and, and see. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. I think it's amazing. I love you. And I, 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 I'm a big fan. So I think it's absolutely amazing what you make. But I'm going to go. Thank you for that, Delia. And I'm going to talk to Holly now. Hi there, Holly. Hiya. Remind me where you're based again. Uh, Sheffield. No. Sheffield. Yeah. That's it. I knew that. I did. It did know that. I was just <laughs> gone for a second. So uh, did you study there? No, I studied at Birmingham School of Jewellery, so I graduated from their um, jewellery design and uh, related products course in 2016. Right. Then I had two years um, back at home where I set up from the garden shed. Yes. And uh, home, and then, home is, is home Sheffield? No, home is uh, Warwickshire, um, kind of like right on the edge of the Cotswolds. It's lovely, so I really enjoyed it. And I kind of, I knew that I needed to move somewhere else and, and set up my own my own place really um to progress further I think and it's been the best decision yeah. um I've made really so I moved to the uh, Yorkshire art space yes yeah I'm part of the starter studio then well I technically should have graduated from the from the program in October but they're extending it because of um the whole situation <laughs> right. yes that's good I'm glad to hear they're cheering you out <laughs> yeah definitely it's quite it is an inspirational group of you there isn't it it must be really a great place to work yeah there's quite a few of you incredible. and they're doing the digital fair actually there's a number of yeah people. I mean Brett Payne is is the studio opposite us we've got Penny Withers just down the way from us and we've got Jenny and Gill as well um just down the way um so it's, it's um full of really incredible uh, makers who are a lot further down the line than i am as well so it's it's great to be able to they've got a bit of an open door policy in some respects you can kind of go and ask for um a bit of advice here and there if you're in need well, at all but um well, it's great it's a great brett's a great guy as well and he's got incredible the skills he's got is out of this world isn't it phenomenal yeah <laughs> so do you want to tell us a bit about your work yeah so um i kind of classify my jewelry as art jewellery um, each piece is a, a one-off I kind of I don't really make repetitions of things um, necessarily I try and steer away from that um, and it's all uh, paintings built up in layers inside a type of eco resin um, so you can see some <laughs> I tried to get the biggest pictures I could find here so it kind of they kind of have a bit, have a bit of depth to them because the paintings are spaced out um, and they're really lovely and lightweight as well um, because of the okay. resin and then I set them in silver um, in lots of different ways. So you build each layer up. So so, la so laser resin, then you paint, and then you layer mm -hmm. on top. Yeah, exactly. I think the Japanese do it um, to an extreme where they build like whole 3D pictures 
uh, inside resin like that. So I'm doing it um, <laughs> in a in a more abstract um, painterly way, I guess. It kind of started off being very, mm, maybe not neat, but more realistic and botanically inspired, obviously, like I was painting kind of fronds and and leaves and things in there. And I still do a little bit of that, but um, I've shifted and kind of expanded my color palette um, and become more focused on the, the mark making, really the brush strokes and the movement that brings and things like that. So how was your work developed then? So where did you say you finished at Birmingham in 2016? Yeah. 16. So yeah. your work is sort of would you sort of is it loosened then really as you've as you've come along in terms of the, yeah. the painterly qualities? Yeah, I would say so. It's definitely become more expressive. Um, I started off just painting kind of directly into moulds. I was also using kind of scraps that were left over from my graduate collection. I had loads of bits of resin built up and I didn't want to waste them. So it started off by just trying to reuse what I had and um, painting into moulds, which was very constricting. And then I kind of discovered painting in much larger sheets. It was just experimentation with with moulds and mould making and things like that to enable me to be able to do that. And then cutting down those sheets into smaller pieces. So you really focus in on uh, marks that you just wouldn't have noticed when it was in a larger painting really. So um, yeah, really enjoying playing around with that. And um, my work was very turquoise and blue and green to start off with. And it's still, those are still definitely my favorite colors. Um, but trying to bring in, you know, a whole range of different shades to, uh, appeal to everyone really. <laughs> so how have you developed the range? I mean do you normally sell directly to the public or do you sell in different ways? Um, a mixture. Um, definitely the last few years I sold mainly at um, most of my work at shows so in person. <laughs> yeah. So this year's been uh, you know turned everything on its head for everyone hasn't it really but it's been quite eye-opening to see how doing things in different ways uh, can really work and in some ways be better than before because you're not traveling places, you're not spending loads of money staying places either. And yeah, it's not the same. I, I'm not saying I'm enjoying it quite as much selling, trying to sell more online. Don't say that, don't say that. Well, no, <laughs> we're hoping it's going to go back to normal at some but point. I, I, to I totally understand that because that's something that I've thought about as well is that there is, there is obviously there is the not seeing people, but then we were trying to create these opportunities for people to meet. In yeah this way no it's been really exciting um it's just a different sort of challenge um but it's, it's really nice to see it, it working in so many ways as well but i am craving real life shows at some point <laughs> so where are you actually up in shepherd are you able to go into the workshop and do all those things it's, it's totally yeah we are this time um yeah. in the first lockdown we were it wasn't closed, but we were very much strongly discouraged from from, go, from going in, yeah, which is fair the enough. The second so. lockdown has been much sort of, well, it, it doesn't feel that different, to be honest. Mm. I don't know about everyone else things. I guess we've learned a lot from the first one and we're kind of doing things in a much more careful way. So yeah. being able to keep things open is great. Otherwise, I was really dreading the second one and, and maybe not being able to go to the workshop yeah. just before Christmas. <laughs> but no. um, we're still able to go, just, just keeping... Um, keeping all the rules in place. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, well, thanks, Holly. Thanks for telling us about your work. Claire, I'd, I'd like to talk to you now. How are you, Claire? Hi there, I'm fine, thank you. Yeah, so where really... are you... Yeah. Great, where are, you, where are you based, to remind me? Um, I'm based in Tetbury, in, uh, in, the, in the Cotswolds. Yeah, which is great, yeah. Lovely, lovely mm. part of the world. It is, absolutely. And it sort of really inspires my work, totally. You know, we're just a couple of miles away from the Western Arboretum. And so, you know, I, we walk there a lot and, and I use the leaves and yeah, picked up loads and loads of leaves the other day. And, you know, and that is the basis of my work, really. Yeah. So where did you where did you start out in textiles? Yeah. Um, I think I just have always done textiles. I can't ever remember not playing around with fabrics and actually doing things. You know, as, as a child, I, I loved um, knitting and sewing and making things. Um, and then I talked for... 30, I don't know, 33, 34 years um, teaching food and textiles and art. Um, and during that, it was great to be able to sort of try different things with the children as well. And I found that very inspiring. Uh, and But also I was creating my own work as well, which is sort of developed, you know, I've tried all sorts of different textile uh, work. But I think it was during lockdown 
that you know I certainly during lockdown I've developed my new collection which I'm really happy with yeah, yeah they're, really... they're, they're photos I mean you've sent in a collection of pictures uh, do you work with yeah. this article studio yes pictures? I do yes because yes. they they uh, yeah. they're a fabulous set of pictures I mean that, that's what I always <laughs> dream of really is a really great set of pictures that we could yeah. use for various things and it just yeah. it's, it makes such a difference doesn't it when you get when you it get does. it makes a great. huge difference yes yeah. Yeah. So, no, so what, what do you make? So you work because when I, when you first started doing shows with me, I think it was in Cardiff. Yes. yes. And you, you were very much, it was very much, uh, clothes, you know, clothing, wasn't it? Yes. Well, when it, it's developed, I think, and as all artists it actually develop. And I started off really doing a lot of sublimation printing. Uh, and I was printing directly with leaves um, onto fabrics. Um, and the designs were, I, they were very vibrant, very, very colourful, very, very busy. Um, but the downside of sublimation printing is that you can only really print onto polyester. Um, and Your sound has suddenly gone. Is that, is that just for me? Is anyone no, else? No, it's gone. No, Lynn, uh, Claire, your sound has gone for some reason. I don't know why. You're not on mute. Liz Cooks, Liz Cooks yeah. just ran away. Um, <laughs> <laughs> can you hear me now, Claire? Yes, I can. Yeah. There we are. So, Carry on. Yeah, Sorry, you were saying about was printing yeah, sublimation. Yeah, yeah. What can you explain it? I don't know what sublimation printing is. That well, just where you layer on. If I just turn around. So, sublimation yeah. printing is using um, the heat press. There. All right. Okay. And so yeah, I sort of developed a way of, of actually sort of adding colour to natural leaves and then printing directly onto the fabrics using the heat press. Oh, right, um, okay, okay. It, I looked, it was absolutely fantastic. Um, but it was just something about using all the polyester fabrics, you know, that I wasn't totally happy with. Yeah. So during lockdown, I had time, you know, which I think a lot of people have found to actually really sort of think about what I wanted to do. Um, choose a, a linen range that actually sort of went together rather than doing, you know, lots of different things uh, and having time to actually think about designs. Yeah. So the, the present collection is, is all based around herbs, a lot of the napkins and things. So, you know, they're, and, they're, and they're just very, very much more simple um, designs. Um, and then they're all based around plants. Um, I'm very lucky to have a studio in the garden. Well, you know, looking out into the garden, which is fantastic. So I could work the whole way, you know, through lockdown. Uh, and we're surrounded by fantastic countryside. So, you know, it, it's picking up leaves and looking at the trees and going to Western Bert and, you know, just inspires what I do. It's well, it's, been a, it, it's an obvious uh, re re development in the work. You know, it's quite, it's yes. quite you, know, you can see the way it's come together, the colour palette mm -hmm. as well is... Yes, it's really rich, you know, but it's yeah. it's it's lovely. You please, yeah, me? yeah. No, I am. Yeah, no, I am. I've just got a new colour, which I've been printing this morning actually for uh, for uh, the the festival, and I absolutely adore this colour. It's just lovely. I mean, it's just autumn summed up, isn't it? Yeah, is it like a rusty? <laughs> is it a rusty orangey, lovely colour? Right? Colour, and it's absolutely gorgeous. Yeah, really lovely. So Brilliant. yeah, so I'm well, just uh, that's my next job. Yeah, no, exactly. There's the, yeah, we've got two weeks to go. We'll be fine. Yes. So, <laughs> um, I'd like to talk to Liz now. Liz Cooksey. Hi, Liz. Hi. Hi. How are you doing? Because I know you've got a lot of strong connections in the Bobby Tracy area. I have. My family live down there. Yes. Yeah, but you don't do. No, I'm miles away. I'm up in north in Manchester. Yeah. 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 But that, well, thanks for all the commitment of well, all of you that actually make it down to Bobby Tracy. I, I, I it's uh, much appreciated. But thank you for joining us today and um i've uh, you know I've, I've bought a piece of your work once upon a time and uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do uh well um i i studied um a long time ago it shows my age compared to some of the young people here um and i did uh embroidery at manchester manchester poly uh probably before daniel i think <laughs> and um so I suppose the heart of what I've done always is sort of textile embroidery, but over time it's really evolved. And um, I, you know, I used to do an awful lot of um, hand stitching and machine embroidery, and um, gradually it sort of uh, I got involved in working with wire, and uh, and just loving the properties of wire and what it can do. Um, and um, I suppose 
uh, that's become a bit like my sort of signature now is using wire and textiles together. Um, although <laughs> I was at one of the, the shows, um, I think the last Bobby show where somebody, I, I was supposed to be textiles and they said, well, where's the textiles? And I've now sort of like put myself under the mixed media sort of bracket because um, the text don't let me bully you and the wire and the uh, and the, all the other sort of processes and techniques are sort of becoming more sort of dominant I suppose yeah because yeah. I'm always uh when I come to see your work in the shows oh and I, I follow you on Instagram as well and I just see that just the constant development that you do it seems to be there's always a new you're moving forward rapidly all the time yeah, yes, I am. I'm all. I'm sort of. I love a. I love a technique. I love a process. Um, I sort of. It's interesting listening to Olive about the tatting, because um, um, I had to go at the tatting, and I, I haven't got a lot of patience. I don't read instructions, and uh, I crochet. I mean, the, the main thing that I do is combine crochet with wire. I suppose that's the sort of the substantial part of my work. Uh, but I can't follow a crochet pattern, and um, I sort of taught myself to crochet with YouTube. Um, so I, sort of everything's very sort of technically low, so low in sophistication. It's like a bit hit and miss, you know. We're... Frozen now for a minute. Well, maybe give her a second to unfreeze. Can you hear us, Liz? Needle tatting, but I combine it with wire, so you get sort of almost like a little uh, structural, uh, three-dimensional thing when you start combining it with wire. Um, but it often is difficult to tell between tatting and crochet. Sometimes people think what I do is tatting. So that's quite interesting. Um, but I think it is always evolving, partly because I just uh, like experimenting and playing and seeing what you can do with something. And that's why the wire is really interesting. So with wire, you know, you can it can be very structural. It can, you can draw with it, um, you can get different gauges, um, and its potential for doing such a variety of tasks um, is immense. So I'm just working my way through them. <laughs> yes, because you sort of like, you were square shapes and circular shapes, and now you're sort of broken out of the frame, literally. Yes, I mean, I for a long time, I was sort of working within uh, a frame and the confinements of the frame, um, and I sort of realised that, um, yeah, I wanted to sort of like give myself more scope. So I started doing things and realizing because the wire can hold itself up and it, it's structurally sort of sound, uh, it gave me more versatility to sort of become, um, yeah, more three dimensional. So now I combine the two. Um, but I suppose, you know, like there's a piece here that would, sum, I think, sums me up a bit. I don't know if you can see it, mm. but that's where it sort of combines a lot of different techniques. So there's the wire, the crochet, but there's also little illustrations, there's little printed elements. Uh, there's bits of hand stitching. Um, I mean, it's a bit like an eclectic mix of uh, different techniques and processes. Um, and it's maybe because I'm just sort of sometimes I'm lacking a bit in patience and, or you, you start something, you get a bit bored and you pick up something else. So it allows for just um, a variety of playing. <laughs> I think I think the, your inventiveness is probably I think there's lots of fan girls in the room here I think or fan boys yeah. because it's just the work's absolutely phenomenal and I just love the way that because it seems very uh, you know are you have you got a very specific idea because you know they're so structured and I can and I complete you know I mean I'm, when you make them are you you've got a very specific ideas when you make no no it's terrible it's like I if you could see my room it, I mean behind you can see some jam jars of of um, bits and pieces. I have trays of things that I make and I just sort of make them without really like knowing quite where they're going to fit or what they're going to be. So when um, I come to make a piece, it's a bit like shopping where I'll go and pluck and pick out bits and then start bringing them together um, and, and seeing where that goes. I often find if I have too much of a clear idea in my head and then I try and meet that idea, it, it never quite works. So it sort of, it has to evolve a little bit. Um, and it's a bit like a puzzle where, you know, again, with a piece like this, I'll have had a lot of those elements individually made and I didn't know that they were going to come together like that. Um, and then bringing them together is, is the sort of the challenge. Um, and there are times where, it, you know, it's, it doesn't always work out and I'm trying to find the missing piece just to finish it off or to get it to work. Um, 
So it's not very planned or thought about. It's just, again, a, an That's evolved. fascinating in itself, Liz, because I would have thought that because the way that they come out, they don't, they, they don't look like, they don't look like random pieces of work. They're so incredible. If, if you saw the chaos, the chaos of my work desk <laughs> in the process, you'd get it more. Yeah. That's, that's amazing. Well, th thanks very much, Liz. I'm going to go move on to Linda. Linda Shell. Hi, Linda. Hello. <laughs> How are you? Where, where, are you, where are you based now, Linda? I'm in Cardiff. Yeah, I'm in Cardiff, yeah. And, and how long have you been making? Oh, gosh. Um, well, I graduated in 2004. Yes. And, um, I was a mature student then, so <laughs> I'm very, very old. <laughs> um, not at all. But yes, I did a contemporary textile course, so it was quite a mixed media course. Was that at Cardiff? That was in Cardiff, yeah. yeah. Yeah, what used to be known as UIC back then. Um, and I, that's where I fell in love with screen printing. Um, yes. And, and I also fell in love with dyeing, but that sort of went onto the back burner a little bit, and I've just sort of started to re do that again. But printing is the thing that I love, and I, I you know, it's a constant fascination for me. So you make the, you make the, the, the fabric that you, you print it yourself and then make it turn it into other things? Into bags, yeah. Well, I, um, I mean, people are always asking me how I get my patterns. And, um, you know, I, I think people think you just sort of pluck them out of your head but I've got a little bit of a fascination with all things um, mechanical and industrial so I'm a bit of a, a nerd that goes around lots of museums and I take lots of photographs of like you know old um, war planes and vehicles and engine parts and anything that has cogs and dials and you know you show me a little set of a row of pistons in an engine and I'm, I'm suddenly quite excited you know so I take all these photographs um, and then I come back and I sort of load them all up onto the computer and then I select one put it into Photoshop and then I start stripping bits away from it. So I always turn it into a black and white photograph first. Um, then I start stripping all the sort of elements away that I don't want. And, and then it just kind of something emerges, a little pattern, a little shape, a little, you know, a little squiggly wire or something just comes out and that excites me. Um, so then from there then I take that little abstract shape and then I start repeating the shape and fitting it together and suddenly a, a kind of a, a pattern just starts to emerge and I you know the biggest problem I have is I make hundreds of patterns and it's choosing which ones to actually put onto a screen that's yeah. you know, what's difficult. So um, then that gets transferred onto a screen print Yes, yeah, it gets printed onto an acetate, and then yeah. um, I don't do that myself. I can, but I don't have the dark space. But um, right. it gets printed onto an acetate, put onto a screen, and then I start printing. Um, the collection I've got at the moment is printed on linen, um, and uh, the, this particular collection, all the photographs I took were at the um, uh, Belfast Titanic Museum in Belfast. And there's, they had some um, photographs there of the Grand Staircase. I don't know if anybody has ever seen the Titanic, but they, they, they had this massive glass dome in a, in a grand sort of staircase setting. And the dome was just huge. It's so sad that it's at the bottom of the ocean now. But they had some really good images of it that I took pictures of. So, um, again, I stripped away all the elements that I didn't want till I got to a shape. And what's quite interesting is from the same photograph, I can get two completely different patterns by stripping away different elements. So um, this is one, I don't know if you can see that there. Mm -hmm. That's from the glass dome, stripped away elements, you know, squashed it, repeated it um, until I came up with this pattern. But from that same image, I also got this pattern, which is quite different just by stripping away different elements of it so you can get really lost in that part of the process just you know yeah. stripping different bits away and it, I just find it really fascinating yeah. so then you apply it to and then you turn it into bags and accessories yeah, yeah I, I'm mostly bags um 
and all the bags are kind of also my own designs so um you know there's no patterns i'm not a, i'm not a good pattern follower either i tend to make things up so so there's before a bag gets this far there is lots and lots of prototyping seeing what works what fits you know you have to think of the practicality of the bag as well as how the design is going to fit together um so so yeah this is there's a quite a lot of process in it so do your customers lead you uh, sometimes into what kind of things they want um, not usually uh, you know very occasionally somebody will say I'd like that a little bit bigger or a little bit smaller and I can do that but generally um you know they they sort of just go for whatever I've I've produced so um, in terms of the the, the the interest in the mechanical um uh, things in the world what is that from a particular part of your life that that of your family history that you well yeah I think I think probably where I got it from is um my dad's a boat builder uh, or was a boat builder um, and I just spent so much time in his workshop and there was just always you know bits of engines and tools and you know sort of things hanging around but all the kind of old stuff um, and I suppose he had an interest in you know old aircraft and things so we used to go to a lot of museums as a child so I think that's probably where it came from and I'm quite fascinated with kind of supersized industrial stuff as well. So, you know, if you get a massive cog wheel in an industrial place, I, I don't know why, I just, just find it really exciting. <laughs> well, it's quite weird because uh, as a family, uh, my sister, and well, my sister particularly, she fears large ships, right? Oh, really? And, but my great grandfather used to sail ships to America. You know, he was, the, we, we used to have a great grandfather. So it's weird. And my father is, terribly seasick he can't he has to be knocked out if he goes onto a ferry you know so it's like so it's a weird you know you just wonder where families you know get their interest from and how it manifests manifests itself but i find the whole thing with shipbuilding it's interesting yeah. but i'm a bit scared yeah it, <laughs> what, it, it, i don't know what it's about <laughs> it, it's, it's fascinating i mean i you know I, my dad's skills are you know amazing because he's obviously was a traditional boat builder originally uh they used to build um uh lifeboats for um the ships that used to come into cardiff dock so if the lifeboats got condemned they would build the lifeboats they were all clinker built and and it was just it was just a hive of activity down there and i and it was all dirty and lots of metal things and lots of you know little drawers with lots of nuts and bolts in and i i just used to spend hours enjoying that it's strange really but so is that cardiff bay as it is now was it would be down in the docks down yeah, in cardiff bay? yeah they they actually knocked his workshop down when i was in university i think it was 2003 um so i i went around and i took lots and lots of photographs for for memories it was quite sad i felt it was quite sad yeah. um but yeah it was right literally right on the dock there because that area is yeah well it's beyond it's it's beyond recognition. I mean, you, oh, you yeah. as the public wouldn't really have gone there, really, was it? It's a working yeah. area. Yes, yeah, it was an industrial yeah. area. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I did find it very sad. And my dad can still walk around, though, and pinpoint where things were and where the docks, you know, the docks and ships were coming in and stuff. So it, it is quite fascinating. Yeah. Um, but yeah, but having said all that about all the mechanical and industrial stuff, um, back last year, I did a, an exhibition um, called Woolworks, and um, I sort of challenged myself to to go in a different direction. And so I started to get back to the dyeing, as I mentioned earlier. I, I used to like dyeing in in university as well. Um, and so I sort of resurrected all my photographs from when I was in Finland of all the reindeer. And I loved all the reindeer antlers and you know the, the shapes that they grow in. And I don't know if anyone's really taken any notice of a, of a reindeer's fur, but it, it's very, very soft and blended, the, you know, the patterns. Um, so inspired by that, I did a collection, a small collection of um, kind of shibori. I don't know, does anybody familiar mm -hmm. with shibori? So, um, what I did, they, these are the kind of things that came out of it. Oh, really? And then there's a kind of um, duffel bag. 
shape. So you've used the shibori technique to get those patterns, have you? To get those patterns, yeah. And I used the same process of taking photographs and then stripping them back and coming up with a kind of an abstract shape. Um, but this time I got um, these shapes then made into perspex. So basically you clamp together through, you fold the fabric, clamp that together and then do a kind of dip dyeing process. So, you know, I'll dip it in and then take it out and dip it back in so far. So it's trying to graduate the, you know, the, the color. So it goes from sort of light to dark. And I just absolutely loved doing that. It was just, so I, I, I've got to try and marry the two things together somehow so that they sit nicely in the collection because I love doing that and I love doing this. So. so do you think you wouldn't have had, was that during, that wasn't during lockdown then? No, it wasn't before. during lockdown. It was because we, um, I'm a member of a group called uh, Makers and Practitioners Group in Cardiff. Um, and we just had this little project with a, another group, similar group in Finland. Um, and I think that because there was a sort of little project with an exhibition, I just challenged myself to go into a different direction rather than doing the same thing I always do. So it's, it's really good to, to challenge yourself. And this is a kind of a freer process. I was listening to some of the others talking about, um, you know, the, the sort of the freer element of things and seeing what happens. Yeah. With print, it's quite controlled. You know what's going to happen. So it's it's actually really quite nice to sort of go, do you know, I don't know if this is going to work. Sometimes it doesn't work at all, but what comes out is still nice. So, um, yeah, I quite, I quite, I'm quite enjoying that freedom. Yeah, well, you're going into the Daniel sort of area now, aren't you? Yes, not yeah, sure not as plastic as his. I take my hat off to him. I would be soul destroyed if I lost that much work. Um, usually if something goes wrong, I try and, you know, so, it can be something in itself. It's something I still try to use, you know, but um, no, I, I take my hat off to him. That that would be really hard work. <laughs> well, has anyone got any questions for each other? <laughs> Don't know. <laughs> I did have one earlier and I can't remember what it was now. Yeah, was that... Well, I wanted to ask you then about whether what lockdown has done has has it has it brought some positive aspects to your practice so we'll go around again in order so um emma slash olive uh yeah. <laughs> i know you talked a little bit off camera that you've not been been too well so that's not a yeah. great thing but what is has, no. there been good, has there been good stuff to come I mean, out of lockdown the first lockdown um my husband actually carried on working as normal. So I was at home with the children. And that was really hard because I was still actually working from home for my day job as well. Um, but he did find time to build the studio I'm in now, which is just in the garden. It's a couple of paces from the house. So that has been really good. Um, going back to normal has been much harder. And I actually had to take a couple of months off my business, really, sort of August, September and into October even, because it's just too much to juggle with the, the managing the school and the new rules of the college I work. Um, and then, yeah, being um, ill last week with COVID myself, it, it has been a drain, but um, because I've had to isolate from them, I've been hiding in my studio, actually. And the last week, um, you know, I've been a bit unwell, but I've hidden in here and I have actually designed a lot of new stuff um you know I was I didn't feel great but it sort of no. got, took my mind off it so actually the being ill bit has allowed me to just take a breath and hide away from the rest of the family and focus a bit on stuff I love yeah. because my life is so chaotic <laughs> in normal terms if I could hide in here I would happily do it all the time I so, just yeah. noticed your just a card pins as well I'm sorry I didn't notice them till now that's okay just a card. I've especially I I know. Well, enough well done. I don't uh, have a craft one yet. Because indeed, yeah, I know I've got, I, I'm launching, a going to have lots of craft festival merch to buy and I've got all the badges in the world. But there's in their indie week starts uh, the week beginning of the digital festival. So I'm hoping that we'll get a yeah. little action on that as well. So, yeah. Uh, but they're a great organisation, aren't they? As well? yes. Yes. Yeah. So Daniel, what about yourself? How's lockdown been for you? Uh, interesting. Um, I managed to catch the, the virus, the, the first lockdown, 
which wasn't very pleasant. I I I wasn't bad enough hospital, but I was in bed for a few weeks, and it took me a few months to get back up and running again. So uh, yeah, so I, I while a lot of my friends and people were kind of dealing with the, the weirdness of lockdown, I was just stuck in bed for a bit of it, and yeah, 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 yeah. unpleasant experience. <laughs> yeah. So the second time though, this time has been, uh, it's not really affected how I've worked as much this time because I, I just come down to the studio and I get on with stuff and just, yeah, and try and, like everybody else, trying to make a living and trying to make it all work. So yeah. one yeah. thing that I did notice that what was nice is when eventually after the first in during the first lockdown as eventually when I got better and I was get, able to get down to the workshop because I didn't have much energy I was I was working quite slowly and I found actually this is quite nice actually not rushing around trying to do as much which is what my normal default a bit like Olive you, you're just trying to juggle so many different things and that space and time to kind of think about things and yeah it was really good but I, I have noticed it's creeping back slowly I, it, that I'm getting busier and busier and busier. And I, I, was, I was sort of hoping that, you know, the world was, would have slowed down entirely, you know, as a, as a result. And uh, everyone would be just have this new sort of feeling of like, no, we don't mm. need to do a thing all at the same time. But this, it's, it is that the, the, because I remember in January that I felt that the world was already going at the breakneck speed. And that was, I thought, oh, goodness me, are we going to keep on top of it? So it slowed things down tremendously. But I suppose at least you've had COVID, Daniel. Hopefully you don't get it again. Yes. Uh, you know, so that's, <laughs> that's, you know, sort of positive. But yeah, I know exactly. But it's it's good that there's, there's, there's work out there, though. I think that's, how, that's the way we have to look at it. Mm, yeah. Oh, it's, I think that the whole slowing down is really good. I just, it, kind of, it was just very, very, very rare that everyone can experience that and I'm not saying everybody did there's still people who are working very very hard and all that but generally most people are having to slow down because they, you just had to and I, I think, know extraordinary yeah. what about you Holly um it's been a roller coaster definitely I think same with everyone um there's been some really great aspects and some really <laughs> low points as well um so I meant I don't know if I mentioned actually I moved back home with my parents because my garden shed workshop was still there um, so I could still have a space to work from during the first lockdown, which was great when I built up the, the positivity to actually go in there and start making. <laughs> there was a period where I was just like, uh, I just couldn't really carry on. <laughs> and, then, and then it got a lot better because I, I, well, I lost my part time job because of everything. But then that left me loads of time to focus on this. So it's kind of swings and roundabouts. <laughs> definitely but it's all going in the right direction still so it hasn't been yeah yeah it's been very difficult isn't it because I, I think we got the first few weeks were okay and then suddenly it started to get to about week five and I remember thinking oh no you know this is actually going to last a long time yeah, yeah. Dr. Whitty, Dr Whitty said something and I was just like oh my god <laughs> I know so, it was crazy it was crazy because I remember the week before I'd popped her well I had some work to deliver and I I um, went and visited my parents at the same time and my mum was like you need to decide now where you want to be during lockdown and I was like that's not gonna happen don't be silly and then night of lockdown I was packing my bags at, until two yeah. ago <laughs> well at least I mean I think that you, you hopefully got a few roast dinners and things like that so it might have been uh, you know if your mum and dad looked after you a bit yeah no definitely it was really nice <laughs> oh well Claire what about you well obviously you said you've you've developed a whole new range of work yeah I, I'm I just feel very fortunate, really, because I've kept really well the whole time. And I just spent a lot of time gardening and being in the garden and going for walks when we can. Um, and just having time to actually do a lot of sewing and printing and uh, designing. I also had a focus because I was lucky enough to do um, sort of the Great British Exchange, uh, John Lewis week, uh, two weeks ago. So I was in there for a week. Uh, and that was great and that also gave me a focus during lockdown to actually um, get a collection together uh, and and do lots and lots of sort of making towards that so I'm someone who actually needs a focus that was really good to have that to focus on. I need to talk uh, to you about that actually because they've been in touch with me so I need to know what you think about it all so it sounds like it was a very positive experience. It was a really positive week really really it was a really good week and like everyone else was saying it was just so nice after 
five months to actually see members of the public and customers and actually get a bit of feedback from people to say that they like their work and actually to buy things and actually to talk to people. Yeah. So it, it was it was really great to actually and I hadn't realised till then how much I had actually missed that and actually missed seeing people and talking to people uh, and explaining the process as well. You know, people were asking, you know, about the designs uh, and it was so, so great to actually, uh, to, to just to talk to people uh, about what I did. It was lovely. Yeah. Uh, Liz, what about yourself? A bit like Holly, it starts off like a bit of an emotional roller coaster. I remember at the very beginning just being absolutely sort of such a sense of disappointment for all the things that were going to happen, uh, you know, workshops, things that got planned, the Bubby Craft Festival, all those things, and just coping with that level of disappointment and panic to thinking, oh my gosh, how am I going to earn my living? What am I going to do? Um, and then, you know, putting it in perspective and seeing the bigger picture. Um, and, and I suppose just getting my head around doing things like this, putting myself really really out of my comfort zone and doing more things online and realizing i can do it um you know i can be brave i can you know step up and it opening up different avenues um so yeah it's been it's been mixed um but i, I felt I felt pressured to be working all the time um because of thinking oh my gosh everything i would have usually done to make a living sort of you know just changed so, uh, yeah, it's, it's felt um, highs and lows. <laughs> yes. yes, I hear you. I hear you, sister. Honestly, yes. it's like I couldn't, I couldn't agree with you more. It's been a roller coaster, right, to try and work I bet. out. Yeah, it's been great having, you know, your, your sort of amazing energy to be you know, inspired by. Thank so. you. Thank you. But I think what's interesting is to see the difference between uh, doing the festival in June, which was sort of like thrown at people, whether they liked it or not. Yes. And it was like... Ah, it was a bit like blind needing the blinds, really. I was doing all the, my arms were going fast, but I was just yeah. like, oh my goodness. So, but is it to see the difference in uh, the confidence of makers now about doing live things and doing these mm -hmm. hotels, and, but also seeing the benefits of them? Because it's not just about the fact that we're recording something and it's going to go out to the digital festival. It's actually us being in a room talking to each other right now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's what I take away. I was like, oh, that's what I take away from the whole thing is is being uh, uh being able to get us together and and support each other and to realise that often we're all going through the same thing. That's it. Sort of shared experiences, shared shared feelings. Yeah, you're not alone when you can often feel a bit alone when you're just working away for hours. Day. Well, this is it, and that's what the shows do, is that because when I was a maker, I'd be like, oh, in my shed, as everyone is in their, in their own cliff sheds. And then you go to a show and it'd be like, well, hey, I'm with all my all my people. I understand these people, you know, <laughs> and they understand me, more importantly. And, uh, you know, you, when they take that away, this is what we've got left. We've got Zoom now. This is our little gatherings, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but Linda, what about yourself? You obviously talked about other things that you've done. What about what has lockdown been for you? Um, well, yeah, well, I was thinking it was a bit shell-shocked when it first started, um, but I um, volunteered to make scrubs for the NHS, so um, there was a, a group, there was a fundraiser going on, so I sort of messaged somebody and said, well, I, you know, I, I can make clothes and things. Um, so it was a bit manic for the first six weeks because they, you know, as fast as I was making them, they were dumping more fabric on me and I was, it was just like a proper production line going on. I think I made, personally made about 50 sets altogether. Mm -hmm. um, my neighbour was like, what are you doing? Because it was warm early on and that's why I had my workshop door open and all she could hear is my overlocker going, yeeing, <laughs> for hours and hours on end. Um, <laughs> So, so that that was that was good because it kind of took you. You felt like you were doing something to help, and it took that sort of initial shock away. Yeah. Um, but then that sort of sort of tailed off, um, and then I kind of settled into to, you know, I dare don't say it really, but sort of enjoying it and what other people were saying that the slowing down. I mean, there's mm -hmm. always the background worry about. What things are, how things are going to work out, how you're going to make a living. But the slowing down element of things was, was actually really beneficial. And I never want 
my life to go back to being overly manic I need to somehow find ways of, of yeah. you know managing that but I you know I had my son home homeschooling and my daughter was home so it it, it was okay I think the second time round with winter drawing in is being a little bit kind of Ooh, I'm not not so looking forward to yeah, it. Yeah, because we this we had that lovely period of almost two months of constantly nice weather. Yeah, and I was going, it's because there's no flames. I was like conspiracy theory, like the whole thing. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, I was like, look, I told you, I told you, it's these freaking airplanes. <laughs> and then yeah. it turns out, no, nothing to do with that. But um, yeah, so this time round, it's a bit like yeah, with the, with yeah. the days being shorter and yeah. um you know and I you know my life didn't change that much because I do work from home so yeah. I was still got my workshop and I walk my dog and that pretty much is my life you know um I don't think my dog has ever been walked quite so much um, <laughs> but uh, nice. you know I kind of enjoyed That's those right. elements but, but yeah. there's always that uncertainty for, for, for the future and what's yeah. going to happen the digital craft festival though was was brilliant because like you were saying I, I mean I'm I'm not great on digital stuff and I'm not great on Instagram and all these sorts of things but we have I have been forced to do that and um you know I found the digital craft festival because you can't it's not tangible I can't see it like a fair so I was doing it thinking well I don't know if this is working and I was posting things and there's not that instant feedback but then suddenly you start getting some sales and you think oh it is working yeah, it was really weird when I did the first one I did the first day you know sort of thing and I was all like and at the end I was like I don't know what happened yeah did anybody did anything happen because <laughs> as much as I was chatting to everybody you know because normally you know you see I go around and I say hello to everybody you yeah. know and I actually go how are you doing you know and you go you yeah. tell me it's great though it's oh, I'm not sure you know you at least I know whereas this it was like I don't know so I was like I messaged a few people going is it all right you know what's happening are you making you selling anything so and I think it built up as well over the weekend though you know again um I, I think it, what's interesting is that when uh, when you do it online obviously like as an event I'm, I'm in the same venue as all the other events essentially because they're all on the internet so I've been going absolutely nuts on the on the social media you may have noticed but it's like I can't you've got to sort of make it uh, but also I think I like the fact that we want to try and include all these I think what makes the community is having all those other activities where you can actually meet yeah, yeah. definitely yeah oh, well you know hopefully that's it's all about selling craft at the end of the day but at the same time it's about creating that community and keeping everyone talking about how important it is support makers who've lost did somebody just disappeared quite interesting if we I think Liz just jumped off I don't know <laughs> sure where she's gone maybe she'll come back <laughs> it'd be quite good if we could um you know maybe there will be space in the future to to do both yeah you know, I think one I think probably because what I found really interesting is the engagement with international audience really is yeah. much more, and yeah. which you know which is a, again a happy byproduct of uh doing the you know wouldn't have ordinarily been would never have thought of doing it like this you know um and also attracting some international makers because we've got a few but it's a, it's a very small handful i mean it's not even a handful to be honest but it's just, it's it's something that i'm really interested in is that working with i really wanted european makers to be involved with the show because i don't want us to leave europe basically yeah. so i just thought right let's put this in a way to make it easy for people from you know america or australia to to buy i mean there was a quite a high percentage of people who engaged with the show were from the states and i've had yeah. people contact me saying yeah. um what time's the show opening and of course they're like six hours behind so they're like i said you're gonna have to get up at four o'clock in the morning if you want to get hold this woman from chicago and i was like i said oh ouch you know she's it, it must be key <laughs> so i am um, i had my first sale um from america during the first digital craft festival that was my and it was a commission as well so they she actually had some bespoke earrings Oh, which is really good. That's yeah. Great. Oh, that's good to know. That's good to know. Well, uh, Liz has dropped off, so we're going to say goodbye to Liz. She's probably had the problems with the internet. But thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, yeah. I don't know if you've got any questions for each other. Is there anything we to round up with? No, just good luck, everyone. Hope it goes really well. Yeah, yeah I look forward to seeing what everyone's great. doing. Yeah, yeah. Lovely. well, thanks very much for joining me today. <laughs> and you can be all makers at the Digital Craft Festival. 
www.co.uk for the day to the 29th of November. Thanks very much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.